Okay, we'll uh, go ahead and give everyone a few minutes to let everyone in. We'll get started in, say, two minutes. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Land Management Quarterly. My name is Jim Jansen. Uh, we just opened up the meeting room, and we have several people joining us as we speak. So we will go ahead and just give it, uh, say, two to three minutes, and we'll get started shortly. All right, we're just testing the mic. All right, well, welcome everyone. My name is Jim Jansen. This is our first of the 2022 series of Land Management Quarterly. Uh, today, we'll be going over uh, an outline on the topics that we had put together for today. As always, take a look at Land Management Quarterly as a source for to answer questions as the need arises throughout the year. As always, different information related to land at the University of Nebraska is noted in the link in the upper left-hand corner of this slide. Today's presentation, you'll be having myself, Jim Jansen, found on the left, and then Alan Vanalik is also joining us today, and he'll take the lead on the second half of the presentation. All of the slides today, in addition to the recording, will be posted online, and uh, we encourage everyone, if you'd like to see some of our historic programs, we also have those posted at agecon.unl.edu backslash land management. So be sure to take a look. We've been slowly updating our websites and the Center for Ag Profitability is our best source for information. You'll see the farm real estate website noticed in the, noted in the lower left-hand corner and Alan Van Alec's uh, farmland succession and transition topics in the bottom right-hand corner. Our short outline for today, if you have questions as we're going along, we have several people joining us in our room where we're delivering the presentation. So be sure to type them in or ask them and we'll be more than happy to try and address them. We had a couple of questions that uh, we will be going over as well. So kind of a recap today of what where cash rental rates were at in 2021. How do you figure out a cash rental rate given the cost of production, given the current prices that we're having? Alan Vanalik will be doing an update on lease arrangements for 2022. What do we need to have in the leases? And um, also where can you find a lease if you're in need of one, a written lease? And then finally, we'll briefly review uh, upcoming land management programs in addition to any questions that were submitted. So we'll go ahead and get started. So first topic, topics related to cash rental rates in Nebraska. First thing, where do you find cash rental rates? There are two different places in Nebraska. We have talked about these in the, in the past. One of these is, comes from an annual farm real estate survey that is conducted by the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We do our survey right now. The survey is out. We're slowly starting to get them back in. We're busy entering those into our database and we'll be con conducting the analysis for the 2022 cash rents. The 2021 cash rents are posted right now. And we do encourage you, if you kind of are trying to figure out where you're at, sometimes you have to take a step back and look at where you were at in the 2021 relative to 2022. Our survey is done twice each year. We're related to the publications. The preliminary estimates are published traditionally the second Wednesday in March. And then the final report is in June. As always, the CAP website, if you can make it to cap.unl.edu, that's our best source for extension information related to agricultural and economics, farm management, ranch management here at the university. So be sure to take a look at it and um, more than happy to answer any questions as they come in as well. So briefly, where are cash rental rates at? For 2021, the 2021 cash rental rates are on this slide. These are regional estimates that are published by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And based on these numbers, we do three things. We do what is called HAL. And you notice in the bottom left-hand corner, you see an average of the low grade, average of the high grade, and an average of the entire distribution. 
What is really meant by that, that's the average of the high third, which we call the high grade, average of the low third, which we call the low grade, and average of the entire distribution. Now with the high grade and the low grade or the high third and the low third, there's not a specific yield or soil type or rainfall associated with it. It's a simple average of the, we ask the people, what do you estimate the upper third of cash rent is in your area? Lower third, average overall. As you see here, you can kind of get an inclination. If you're already on the upper third of cash rents, I don't know where you might be headed for 2022 versus if you're maybe in the lower third or not quite as high, you might see some changes coming from that. Also, in addition to dry land rates, we also publish irrigated rates. Irrigated rates from the University of Nebraska are for the center pivot. And we also have gravity or flood irrigation. Uh, for the sake of our short presentation today, we'll be talking specifically on the center pivot rates. These rates assume that the landlord or the land owning entity owns the entire irrigation system. So if you have a land uh, tenant providing say a power unit, say they bring a diesel engine out, these cash rental rates assume that the landlord would own that entire system. If they provide one of those components, you would probably discount the cash rent to reflect for the fact that the landlord doesn't have to pay to keep those up. And once again, we have the breakout here from the low third to the high third average of the overall response. This is for an annual lease, typically from March 1 to February 28th or 29th of the following year. Finally, the other regional cash rent that I wanted to briefly highlight, it's the overall cow-calf pair rental rates for one month. There are many different ways to rent grazing land in Nebraska. You can rent on a daily, an animal unit, seasonal rate, uh, per acre rate. I think Alan and I have counted there's maybe eight different ways you can count these. Uh, based on our estimates, we produce these on a per acre basis, or more commonly, I tend to get the questions on a per pair basis. So for one cow, for one calf, for one month, during the summer grazing season. Now, if you're grazing at a different time frame, you'd maybe make some adjustments to that or use a different figure. Uh, so if you're grazing, say, for five months, and for example, if you're looking at the South District, the average is about $50 a pair per month. If you multiplied 50 by five, that'd give you about 250. Now, if you want to rent by the day, you could easily divide some of these numbers and come up with a daily rate. Once again, these are for one cow, for one calf, for one month during the summer grazing season. Another source of cash rental rate information comes from the USDA. The USDA has a division called NAS. NAS stands for the National Agricultural Statistics Service. And based on their information, what they do is they have a county level cash rent survey. They do it for irrigated and dry land cropland in addition to grazing land on a per acre basis. And they typically do these surveys in odd number of years. So the most recent survey we have is from 2021. I would assume they're going to do it in 2023. But on occasion, they do do it in uh, even numbered years. An example, 2022. We can give the website link on here. So if you would like to find this on your own, I'd highly encourage you, uh, after our recording gets posted, our slides are posted, please take a look at this link. And from this link, you should be able to find additional information. You can also find different uh, statistics that they publish for the overall for the state of Nebraska. Uh, here we have the 2021 cash rental rates on a per county basis. So how we did our presentation today, we kind of start at the region and we step down to the county and then we'll briefly go over some farm level examples. Based on these estimates, you'll notice a few different things. Um, when it comes to the county cash rental rates, uh, a few things to note. There's some counties that are in white. These counties either do not have a lot of dry land cropland, an example out in the sand hills, or these are in regions where um, you do not have um, enough people to respond. So you'll notice we tend to have higher rates in the regions that are in the eastern part. So if you looked at Northeast Nebraska, a lot of these counties along the Iowa state line tend to rent for a little bit higher average than what the western part of the region does. I see we just had a question come in, so we'll see. Okay. And uh, Ryan Evans just provided a link. cap.unl.edu backslash webinars. That's a great place to look for these recordings or any other webinars we do throughout the week and months. Okay. So we have on this slide, the dry land cash rental rates. 
On the next slide, we'll switch here to the irrigated rates. The breakdown on the irrigated rates, so this is a per acre estimate. Uh, the USDA does not pull apart or provide a separate estimate for center pivot versus flood or gravity irrigated. And with that, you'll see that there's certain areas, say along Interstate 80, for example. Along Interstate 80, um, where there still is a fair amount of flood or gravity irrigation, these rates that they have reported would probably reflect kind of a weighted average between center pivot and flood or gravity irrigation. So please be aware of that. And then finally here, we have a uh, grazing land cash rental rate. And once again, if your county is in white, there probably was enough responses that they could produce a number with confidence or in some areas of the state, say for example, York County, um, there's not as much grazing land there relative to irrigated or dry land cropland. And this is a, a grazing seasonal rate that the USDA produces for one acre. Stocking rates tend to reflect these differences. Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, one thing I wanted to point out, I'm sure many people are starting to think about filing their annual federal as well as state taxes here for the state of Nebraska. And with that, uh, what we see here, I gave a link and Nebraska Farm Bureau did a really nice article and I encourage you to take a look at it. There's a small state of Nebraska income tax credit, not a federal, but a state of Nebraska income tax credit that you can receive on a portion of the real estate taxes paid either on agricultural land or if you own a residential home in this state. To get the credit, you do have to file a state of Nebraska return. So if you're not a state resident, I would assume you'd probably still be filing the state of Nebraska return if you were generating land, or cash rent or a share of the crop growing on your ground. Details are given on this slide a little bit about the credit. Just be aware that the credit has gotten a little bit bigger than the prior year. And take a look at the Nebraska Farm Bureau. They even have a little video on there on how to use the Department of Revenue website and how to look up some of the information for the credit. Okay. Few examples here on how to calculate cash rents. Many people look at some of our regional or county level cash rent estimates and they have questions about how do I step it down to my farm? How do I make it into a, a farm level cash rent? So we start on this example and I believe I have two examples here. We start on this example. We say the average cash rent in this county is 165 an acre. And the average county corn yield was say 142 bushel. If you take the average cash rent 165 an acre divided by the average yield, 142. That gives you what? It gives you the county level cash rent per bushel or the county rent per bushel. On every bushel of grain grown in this county, $1.16 is going towards what? It's going towards the sale price of the crop. Or it's going towards the rent. And um, as of right now, corn prices are much higher than they've been in the last few years. So $1.16 in this example isn't too terribly much. Maybe this example should be updated a little bit, but if you take that buck 16 bushel and slide it to the upper right-hand corner of this slide right here, and if you have, if you know, say for example, what's the average production history? It's a number that comes from crop insurance. If you take the county rent per bushel and multiply it by the farm level, the historic average associated with the property, you take the county level and step it down to the farm. You take what you know at the county level and you apply it to a situation where you may not know exactly what the cash rent should be for the county. Another example here, cash equivalent from crop share. Under cash equivalent from crop share, the idea behind this slide is, many folks like the idea of a crop share, but due to the ownership circumstances of the person owning the property, they might feel that'd be a better idea to uh, do a cash rent. Well, how do you take a crop share and make it into a cash rent? So I have an example here. And I know prices for the price of corn are probably gonna be a little bit higher than this this fall, or as of right now, they look to be a little bit higher. But with this cash rent, what we're seeing in this example is we're taking um, half of the crop. So we're saying if we would be on a crop share, say this field yielded 140 bushel per acre, half of the yield goes to the landlord, half goes to the tenant. Okay, so we're sitting in March of 2022. We'll be there just in a few weeks. If you take that, and multiply it by 510 a bushel, the landlord's share of the revenue per acre is 357 an acre. Now, I actually looked up a crop budget put together by Glennis McClure here in the Department of Agricultural Economics, and I pulled out half of the seed, fertilizer, and chemical expenses from that budget. 
I'm very well aware that those numbers have probably been higher, but when they did put the budget together, these were the estimates used. And under a 50-50 split, half of the seed fertilizer and chemical expenses are paid by the landlord. And with that being said, uh, you see with the breakout here, the difference between the landlord share of the revenue minus their share of the expenses, the difference between the two, that reflects the net return to the owner, what they'd stand to make. Now, you'll see as you go through this example, we got March, we have July, and we also have November. Uh, with these examples, depending upon, and I just let the price vary in between the crops here, but what we see is, you know, if you use a higher price in July of 578 versus November, if you use 528, your resulting cash rent can vary a little bit. So as it, Ryan just sent out in the chat box, if you have any questions, be sure to type them into the chat. Alan and I will be monitoring them while each other are speaking and we'll try to answer them as we're going along, or we may just send them, save them until the end of these slides. Okay, and um, moving here, one other example, cash equivalent from hay share. Uh, many people, you might have a small price of ground, maybe it's got some alfalfa or just native grass on it, you're unsure what to charge for cash rent. Maybe it's irregularly shaped, um, you just don't know. Well, if you know, let's say in this example, the property yields two and a half tons of hay per acre. In the first example, under the 3367 or the one third, two thirds split versus a 50 50 split, if a third of the crop versus a half of the crop, in this example, went to the landlord, um, what would be the cash equivalent? Well, the cash equivalent in this case would be about 82 and a half an acre. So basically, if the land tenant wanted to buy out the landlord's share of the hay, the difference between those two is what we have here of 82 and a half. And on the hayland, uh, we have another example here under a 50-50 split, let's say the landlord paid for half of the fertilizer. So the difference between the landlord share of their revenue, $100 minus their share, half of the fertilizer, say 50 bucks an acre. Under this example, they did stand to make a little bit more, about $100. Okay. All right. So we have, uh, we're going to get Alan started here. Uh, that just gave you a brief overview of going from the regional down to the county, down to the farm level cash rents. Alan will take you through what we need to be thinking about related to the lease. One quick question. Uh, where do you see cash rents going for 22? Do you have any sense of that from the early surveys you have in? Uh, we haven't, I don't have a good sense overall for the state. I would say based on the phone calls I've taken, Alan can comment on this in a minute. We tend to see cash rents are probably going to be headed higher. Just how high, given the how high the price of seed and fertilizer have gotten, I don't know. But I think you can talk a little on that too. All right. Okay. So we'll go to the next slide. Let's use a little roller and just roll down. Okay. Oh. I'm, I got it. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Cool. All right. So uh, welcome, good morning. And I, I, I wanna publicly say first, uh, thanks to Ryan Evans for coming in this morning early to, to set us all up and, and uh, have us on the nice room and, and, uh, and uh, with, the, with the actual video camera and all this stuff. Instead of just doing the Zoom from our computer, this is nice to have the actual microphone and all these things. So I appreciate that very much. And then, you know, my comment on the cash rents is, yeah, I think that overall they'll be up a little bit. I don't know how much is up a little bit. I'm not sure because, like Jim just got done saying, we got to fertilizer prices doubling or, or two and a half, maybe up to three times higher than they were a year ago. If seed prices have gone up, fuel prices have clearly gone up. So I'm not sure how that got tempered out in the countryside. I'm not sure where we're at with that. But anyway, I'll go on with the presentation I wanted to make and we'll, we'll go from there. If you got any questions, put them in the chat and we'd be glad to answer them for you. So having a hand, hand excuse me, getting to a written lease is really important. Um, I just had a phone call last week from a realtor, and the realtor wanted to uh, ask me about uh, the lease that he had with some ground that he was working with. The, uh, the children of the parents that just had passed away uh, wanted to sell the ground, and, uh, but it had a lease on it. And uh, I said, so what kind of lease was it? And they said, well, it was a, it was a verbal lease, a uh, handshake agreement. And I said, so uh, what's the question? Well, can we, can we make that lease go away for 2022? And I said, well, you can ask the tenant if they would like to vacate the lease, but quite honestly, they have the lease for 2022 because you have to give them proper notice on a handshake of verbal agreement. For handshake of verbal agreements, the note, it's assumed that those farmland leases start on March 1st 
And so you have to give them a six month notice, which is by, by September 1st of 2021, which is six months ago, basically, because we're almost to March 1st now. So make sure you understand the, the, how that's set up and make sure you get to a, a written lease. Now, if you have a written lease, you also need to make sure that the written lease uh, apply, uh, gives us to when you're going to terminate the lease by. In other words, how much notice are we going to give people if we want to terminate even a written lease? Because I've had people call in and say, you I go I ask the question, do you have a written lease? Yes, we do. Then you follow whatever your written lease says. So if you don't have that uh, specified in your written lease, that's a problem. The fill-in lease forms can be, if you don't have a lease and need to get to a lease, please get one. You can start with the aglease101.org website. It's on this slide right here. There's the fill in the blank lease form on the right-hand side of the screen. And that gives you a great place to start. You won't even use everything. You won't even necessarily use that whole form, but it gives you all the things to kind of think about. Here's what that Ag Lease 101 website looks like. And you're gonna click into the document library to find those, those lists of forms. And when you click on the doc, document library, you look at, look at a page that looks somewhat like this. The fillable cash lease forms are on the right. And uh, it even includes, uh, if you look lower on the right-hand side, well, it includes cash leases, crop share leases, pasture leases, farm building leases, machinery leases, and livestock rental leases. So it's really quite complete and it gives you a great place to start to have written leases for all your stuff. The, the publications on the left actually give you uh, some background information on how to set those leases up. Uh, some of the stuff I'll be telling you right now, quite honestly. All right, so for 2022, a lot of leases start on March 1st and we're not quite there yet. So I just wanna say, um, if you're gonna continue your lease into 2022 and you have a written lease and you need to follow the rules of the written lease. However, if you feel like there's something that actually has to be addressed or talked to, just have the conversation between the landlord and the tenant. Because quite honestly, whatever the landlord and the tenant agree to will be fine. It can supersede what the written lease says. However, you need to make a note in the written lease that that was changed, uh, whatever provision that is and uh, just know that that's what you got going on and, and that's what you have set up. So um, now, uh, some parties wait until February right now to actually um, set a lease or set a lease rate. I'm still getting questions about what the rental rate should be set for this year. And so a couple of comments about that in addition to the comments I made earlier, I think we have to pay attention to fall crop prices versus current crop, crop prices, meaning if I look on, uh, if I listen to the to the TV news and they give a, a current corn price or a current uh, soybean price for the spring, they're going to give it for the March marketing contract from Chicago Board of Trade or from that local elevator, which is based on the March Chicago Board of Trade contract. But that's not what we're selling here. We're not selling 2021 corn. That's already in the bin. And maybe you still are selling that, but where we're doing for this lease this year is selling 22 corn, which should be produced this fall. So you really need to base that on the December contract and the December and then back that into the fall and look at what the what the change in the in the basis is. And so to just the discount's going to be uh, based on where you're marketing it to. So make sure you use the correct marketing year for marketing the crop that you're going to sell. And also uh, be sure that you're thinking about what's important for the, you know, what's important for your property. I tell landlords all the time, we only land, own the land for a little while. And even when we're done owning the land, we're still gonna have to have it sit there and produce very well for the next generation because we're still gonna need land to produce the, the food to feed the world. So maybe, maybe what I should be considering as a landowner is the not, not the top cash rental rate, but I should be considering what, which tenant is going to do a nice job of my property and leave it in a better shape for the next generation, even when I'm not around anymore. And I think we have to do uh, the best thing we can for the property versus getting the highest cash rental rate available, for, according to the local coffee shop, of course. Um, so I think you have to look at things like managing the soil, conservation of the soil, uh, how, how is that being handled? Managing weed, insect, and disease pressure. Are they doing a good job with those kind of things? Make sure your, your fields are being taken care of properly that way. And they're maintaining or improving fertility. And the, things I, the thing I worry about is, is that uh, Jim and I were having, a, we were doing one of these meetings out of Kearney and, and we had supper together and, and we met one of the leading soil scientists in the state, private, private scientists, private soil guy in the state uh, a couple of weeks ago, just, just recently. And I asked him, I said, if we're running 400 and $450 cash rents per acre, do you think that tenants might not want to put all the fertilizer out that they should, especially phosphorus, given that phosphorus is two or two and a half times higher than it was a year ago? And this soil scientist said, yes, 
I absolutely think that people will be mining the soil. Uh, they will not be putting fur phosphorus out there if they don't have to. So the point is, um, you have to make sure you consider things like that and have those conversations to make sure we keep the lease in a spot where the tenant can still make it work from an economic standpoint and still treat your soil properly. <clears throat> Other things to consider will be uh, when we want to have lease timing of lease payments. Uh, so um, there's a slide on that later on, especially one of the questions that was asked. So I'm just going to leave that go for right now. I think we also have to, have to think about irrigation equipment, ownership and maintenance. And Jim already addressed that. The irrigation equipment in most leases should be owned by the landlord. If it's not, then that lease should be adjusted. You talked about that. But the way we typically think about irrigation equipment is I hear it across Nebraska. Again, there's no textbook or research study on this. It's just what we hear from people is that the, the tenant usually provides the labor or the bulk of majority of the labor, the land, the landlord, and the, and the tenant will do a, a deductible for the irrigation equipment maintenance. So in other words, they got the first 300 or $500 or $700 per year. That's their cost. Anything above that, the landlord helps with. My only caution on that is I think that if the tenant's going to make a major change to the irrigation system package, like a, like changing the nozzles on a pivot or or replacing gearboxes on a pivot, that's a kind of a major expense thing. He better let give the landlord some some notice on that, so he's not just blindsided with this great big bill that he didn't know it was coming. So just just have good communication. Um, some other things, fertility and manure management, I already talked about fertility. The manure management is uh, interesting because I think that manure should be accepted. I think manure is a great source of phosphorus. If you get it priced right, it'll do a great job on your soil. Not only improves the phosphorus, but it'll improve the organic matter too. Just think about that. Um, so uh, but just don't take manure every year because it'll make your phosphorus go too high. So just time your manure right based on your soil test and you'll be in good shape there. So stock removal. Um, I think we have to be careful not to, I think grazing stocks is great when you have cattle out on stocks all this time. And matter of fact, there's talked to several farmers recently, just finally, it was such an open winter. They just pulled the stocks off last week for cattle. The cattle off the stocks just a week or so ago, like, like within the last 10 days, because we got to feed those cattle a little extra because they're going to have calves now in March. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I think the grazing stocks is great. I think the thing we have to be careful of is that we're rolling stocks up for bedding or for, for cornstalk bales, that's fine. It can be done. It should be done. It's a great. It's a great resource for people for bedding and for uh, feed even. But I think we just don't want to do it off that one farm every year. We want to make sure we time that so that we've taken it off of a specific field once every second or third time we have corn out there, or fourth time we have corn out there. We don't want to take it off there every time we have corn off there. And hunting rights. Um, hunting rights. Uh, that's a, that's another whole lesson unto itself. I'll just say that that for crop share leases, hunting rights should be split. For cash leases that go year round, assuming they go year round, or even the, the handshake or verbal agreements, hunting rights belong to the tenant unless they're held out of the lease. And if you got questions, you can type them in the chat or get a hold of me later. We'll talk about, we, I can help you. And Jim can help you talk through that too. I'm not gonna spend more time on that right now. Pasture, uh, land, or grazing leases, uh, Jim said, is typically a five-month lease, typically from May 1st to October 1st, or from June 1st to November 1st, or some combination thereof. Some leases are six-month leases. That's fine, too. And, and so for notice of termination, uh, know that because the pasture lease ends every year, if, especially if it's a five- or six-month lease, that the, the, there's no, no specific uh, requirement to, to, to begin that lease then the next year because or, or to terminate that lease for next year because... The lease ended. So the crop for the crop leases, you have to give that six month notice because it's a full year round lease for, for pasture leases because they end termination isn't necessarily no, this isn't necessarily defined. And so make sure you have good communication because uh, if I was renting a pasture for someone last year and I expected to rent it this year and they could still pull it on me now because gave basically the first of March and I, I'd, I'd be very upset about that. I think that the, we have to make sure there's just good communication on that. That's all. Um, I'll, I'll a couple of other comments about pastures. Now, Jim will, Jim will tell you in his talks when we were doing them live that the control of nox, noxious weeds and, and, and brush, specifically eastern red cedar in eastern Nebraska, is always the other, the other person's responsibility. The tenant thinks the landlord should do it, and the landlord thinks the tenant should do it. I define it a little better than that. I just say that I think that noxious weeds should be um, controlled by the tenant in a pasture. I think that uh, brush specifically like uh, the locusts, the thorny locusts and the, 
and the uh, eastern red cedar should be controlled by the landlord. And just make sure you, you do that at an appropriate time. Don't wait till they grow to 15 or 20 foot tall. Get those trees when they're small, you'll be better off. And then for pasture leases, I think it's imperative that we have the conversation about fire drought hail. And because uh, they do happen in Nebraska, they happen in Nebraska all the time. The bottom, you know, what's interesting is that we were out to Broken Bow here about two weeks ago, the same trip where we were in Kearney. And, and, and uh, you know, the Broken Bow people, the, the fire thing was very, very real to them because they just had a fire there the week before uh, and lost a whole bunch of pasture ground. So let's, let's, let's make sure we have those conversations about what happens in case there's a fire or a hail or a drought. So we know that what we know what we're going to do with cattle, either leaving them there or taking them off or reimbursing for some of the lease or whatever we're doing before the lease starts. Let's have that conversation. Uh, how will the length be adjusted? How will lease payments be, payments just be adjusted based on those kind of disasters? Just have that conversation ahead of time. Uh, I think, is, was there a question and answer? Or we said, my, not mentioned property tax expense in your calculations. Have I missed something? They've considered, okay, so it depends on the year that property taxes have increased considerably. I understand that I have farm, I own farm ground too. Um, what do you, I mean, I'm not sure what you want me to say about property taxes. They're going up or down depending on how that's, that's gets set up uh, and, and in your situation. And uh, in a lot of cases that the, the, the landlord will try and pass the, the property tax uh, bill onto the that fits in your situation. I, I understand that that happens. Jim may have some other things to add on to that, but uh, we're, they're trying to give us some property tax relief. Hopefully that'll help our bill as time goes on. We're trying a little bit different of a setup today here at our recording site. So if you folks like this, Alan and I are going to try to answer the questions together and I don't know if we got this room set up quite right exactly how we want it, but I think it's getting better as we've done this over the years. So uh, today's uh, questions that we have coming in, we have three prepared. We're going to go through those first, and then we'll uh, go ahead and answer any in the Q&A as they come in. So with that, here's the first question, Alan. Go ahead. So the, earlier I had in my slide that talked about the timing of when we make rent payments. And uh, um, so all I can talk about is what I hear and what's typical in Nebraska. And let me just qualify my comments by saying that every neighborhood's a little bit different in terms of when rent payments are made. For, so for cash rent, the most typical thing I hear of is what's at the bottom of the slide, the second to the bottom line. The first half and about March 1st and the second half of sometime November, December 1st. Uh, so, so, and you can spe specify whatever dates you want to. There's no real uh, issue with that necessarily. Uh, and especially in wheat country, then you'll end up with that second bullet where you have a third on March 1st, a third on June for June or July, maybe even August 1st, sometime in the summertime, and then again, the third in, in the fall. And I think the reason you would have three payments is because the landlords have to make uh, a tax a payment in April, and they have to make a tax payment sometime in August before September 1st. So I think that's why they, we sometimes have that split in the thirds and get that into um, um, you know, into three payments that's, to make that work out. And, that, and that's a good point that Alan brings up too, is a lot of property old owners or older landowners, if they're retired or semi-retired living on a fixed income, uh, why you see people paying a portion of the cash rent, maybe half or a third up front when the lease is signed, is if these people are trying to make their tax payments, they literally may need the money to uh, make uh, the real estate tax or a portion of the real estate tax payment. I do think it is in good terms to require maybe a portion. I'm not saying you have to pay all of it or even a half of it, but a portion of it up front because there are expenses associated with the property in the state. Oh, I've, I've clear, I have actually lived in neighborhoods where all the all the rent was due on March 1st, and I, I, I'm not a big fan of that. But you can do however you, the landlord intended to agree to. That's 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 more important than anything Jim or I have to say about this. Another question that came in said, should I rent my land out on single or multi-year uh, lease arrangements? Do I want a one-year lease or a three-year lease or a five-year lease? I've even heard of one operation that had up to a 10-year lease on, on ground. And so here's what I would say about that. We, we, the most common thing in the last 10 or 15 years, especially with the prices being so volatile, is a one-year lease. So we can adjust the lease based on what's happening with prices. I think that if, if uh, especially if a tenant has made some significant investment in the land, like for instance, I know of tenants uh, in various parts of the state that put the pivot on the, the ground. I think that if they make that kind of investment, put that pivot in, that they should get a multi-year lease. Now, 
It doesn't mean that you couldn't have a provision in there that says that the lease uh, could be adjusted every year, still adjust the lease rate, but the lease is still in effect. Uh, so I think that that's I think that's something that has to be considered. Uh, how can we still adjust the lease in terms of the rate if we allow a multi-year lease because of this extra investment that the tenant has made? Typically, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. No. I would just highlight what Alan said. The reason people want multi-year leases is if you're doing things to the property that have a benefit to last greater than a year, certain types of fertilizer, whatever, that's why they're after the multi-year lease. So they know that they can get machinery of a certain size to be able to cover all the ground they rent or whatever. And that's fine. Alan and I are always advocates of long-term re lease relationships where both parties benefit. If you do choose to do a multi-year lease, I do feel given the changes that we've seen in crop prices, I mean, who the world knows what's gonna happen this year, it's very dry. Um, given the changes that we're seeing right now, it's not inappropriate to ask if you do decide to do a multi-year lease to have some kind of a renegotiation of the, the cash rent once a year. And remember, if um, you say you'd go to Alan's extreme example, let's say you'd signed a 10-year lease when you sign a 10 year lease and let's say three years in the property owner dies or something happens, maybe you have to sell the property. Whatever is in that lease goes with that land until the lease is over. So if you're dealing with someone, say they're in advanced age and they're having health problems, I'm not sure if a multi-year lease would be the best deal to go with if there would be a potential for a, maybe a sale of a portion of the property because of long-term care expenses, for example. Well, so, and don't take that the wrong way. The property could still be sold, but it'll be sold with that lease in place. Yeah. And so that will, that will deter some buyers because some buyers are the farmers that want to have to yeah. be, able, be able to farm that ground. And, and whatever terms, so if you're doing a fixed lease payment for 10 years, that payment would go to the new landowner. But if that payment's way below where the current market is or whatever, um, there's a lot of things. Okay, I will go to our next question. Uh, one idea I want to pitch to people right now, when it comes to uh, dealing with uncertainty, uncertainty in crop yields, crop prices, or even input expenses, how do we figure out a way to deal with that? One thing that we've been pushing in as part of our extension outreach series that Alan and I have been conducting over the last two or three months now is on the topic of flex leases. We actually have another workshop, an online, uh, much longer than a simple 40, 45 minute presentation we're giving today we actually have a, we call it a flex lease presentation coming up. And with our flex lease presentation, we'll be talking about as part of a flex lease, let's say Alan wants 230 and I want to pay 170. If you can come up with a middle ground between the two of what the wants are, let's say 200 bucks an acre. From that, you can let that cash rent go up or down within a range. Think of 230 as the ceiling, the floor is 170. And there's different ways to set up a flex. And I only have one very basic example. There's more detail on this slide than I can try to explain online here over the next few minutes. In this example, I'm doing a flex lease based off of crop revenue. Crop revenue is a component of yield and price. And you'll see as you step down this slide, so there's two examples on this slide. On the one case on the left-hand side, we have a case where the crop revenue is actually higher than what you had hoped for. Instead of raising 150 bushel, this individual raised only 140. But when things tend to get dry, sometimes prices are a little bit higher. Overall crop revenue was up and we're doing a flex in this example based off a percent of the revenue. And with that, we see on the left-hand side, final cash payments higher. On the right-hand side, we see a case where um, prices are lower than what we had hoped for, but the yields are higher. It just goes to show you because you have good yields, it doesn't necessarily guarantee good revenue. And in this example, I'm not flexing based off of input expenses, but that's just another dimension you could set up as part of this. Two things I'd say off of flex leasing is number one, uh, it, make sure you have a floor and a ceiling. I hear, hear uh, people tell me all the time, well, hey, I got a flex lease, but um, it's basically it's a bonus rent because they has set a floor. It could go up, but it can't go below. I think that it should go uh, e either direction. The other thing to know about flex leasing is simply this, uh, how are you gonna set the price and when are you gonna set the price? I mean, that, that's, the, that's the most com uh, complicated, I don't know, complicated is the right word, but setting the price, what you're gonna do for that price is to, the thing that has to be discussed and cussed the most. Uh, and, and come up with a plan before you start the flex lease. So you're both, so both parties are happy with it. If they work well, Jim's example works perfectly, but you have to set it up for the right way. 
whatever you use for a price, you need to pick a price from a period of time. An example, every Friday in March, and then every Friday in December. You wanna pick it over a period of time. You just don't wanna use one day because whatever day you pick, it's either gonna to be too high, too low, or something in between. I know we have a few questions. I just wanna highlight two things here. Um, we have, uh, as part of our land management outreach series, it's funded by a grant. We just wrapped up, uh, I guess it was a week ago today, we wrapped up our in-person meetings and um, the preliminary estimates on cash rents will be coming out tentatively the second Wednesday in March. And with that, we're actually gonna be doing a virtual meeting series. You can join from your home, your office, wherever you're attending the meeting at. And if you register, and I noticed the registration links on the bottom of this slide, if you register for this meeting, we'll have staff members here at the University of Nebraska, we'll actually send you the paper handouts. I always like to have the paper in front of me so you can write on them. So please take a look at registering. Uh, March 24th, we're gonna be kind of doing a little bit more on Eastern Nebraska focus. And then kind of the Western two thirds is gonna be the following, following day from nine to uh, 1130. So take a note at those times, the Thursday webinar on the 24th is kind of an extended version of our weekly webinar coming out of the department. And then the Friday one, is uh, Western Nebraska focus. And um, take note on our topics that we got coming up. And um, we have our next meeting scheduled for May 16th, which is on a Monday. We're gonna return to our normal time today. Alan and I had some things come up over the noon hour that couldn't be moved. So uh, be sure to take a look. Uh, in May, we will be taking a look at our 2022 cash rental rates. Alan will be taking a look at common communication issues and how do we make decisions and how do we more effectively communicate with the landlord or the tenant or agribusiness professional. So with that, do you have anything to add on either of those? Okay. No, 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 no. Look at, look at the web um, and we'll be glad to help you out. Just uh, keep, send us questions via email or, or to give us a, give us a phone call. We'll be glad to help. All right. So, uh, and uh, Brian Evans put in the chat. If you're up following us, if you click on the chat button, you can actually see the uh, registration link. So take a look at that website and I'd encourage you if you're interested, just register, uh, register sooner than later because we have to get these in the mail and I'm sure we'll have, I don't know, 50 to 100 people over the two meetings register. So it'll take a little time to get these things together. All right, with this, we're gonna try this differently. I'm, I believe from your end, you can actually see these questions. So we're gonna go ahead and answer the first question. I'll read it and then you get answered. How about that, Al? All right, you have, uh, okay, so Alan talked about this a little bit. How does property taxes, more in general, how do we, how does our annual change in our real estate taxes, if they go up or down or anything in between, uh, how do you factor that into cash rent? Well, Alan gave you his opinion. I'll give you my opinion quick and maybe you take the second question. Um, when it comes to real estate taxes, they are not necessarily tied to the cash rent. You can have a year where the real estate taxes go up, but the overall profitability of corn or soybeans or cattle or whatever the deal is, it can be down significantly. We've seen that in recent years. 2020 was a very tight year for a lot of people with the disruption of COVID and that. There's other years that you know, real estate taxes are up, the economy, crop prices, whatever, are pretty good. And you see them go up in tandem. Um, I will tell you when it comes to owning land, you have a return on the land as part of the cash rent. And that cash rent also has to help cover any land ownership expenses, upkeep on things. In addition to upkeep on things, you also have things related to the ownership, taxes, property insurance. Um, be aware of that credit. Alan mentioned and I did as well. That credit has grown this year and the intent of that credit is it's supposed to be getting bigger over time with the legalization of gambling in the state and the tax revenues that come from it. Um, all right, so I'll read the second question. What is the average corn stock rental for Eastern Nebraska? Do you want to answer that? No, that we I don't know that we have a specific uh, survey that gives that average number. Uh, I, I would say that what I've heard recently is that um, corn stock can be corn stocks can be free uh, up to you know twenty five, thirty, thirty five dollars so per acre for the use of corn stocks. And so here's how I would explain the, the differences in those numbers, which is zero to 35. I think that the differences is simply who does the work. If I am, if I am a, um, if I'm a uh, landowner 
that happens to have my own home quarter that's completely fenced out and I've got water in the yard and I'll check the water, I'll check the cows and all the tenant has to do is drop, drop the cattle off and come back in 60 days and pick them up. But then I think that I think that a charge should be given to in that, that sort of thing. I mean, that then I think that a good rent should 15, 20, 25 dollars an acre should be charged. I think that if we're, we're making letting a tenant use a, a, a corn stalks, they have to put up all the fence, they have to put in tanks, they have to haul water every day, they have to do all the work, come check their cattle every day, all that sort of thing, make sure the fence is still up, make sure deer doesn't knock it down. I think if they're doing all that work, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about charging them too much. I, I maybe even make it free. Because the point is, you're probably happy to have that corn, to volunteer corn picked up out of those corn stalks, so you don't have to worry about controlling that corn weed in your soybean crop the next year. Tip rotation. So, especially with the cost of chemicals. Especially with the cost of chemicals. <laughs> if I can eliminate that issue, it just it just helps a ton. That's that would I, you know. So the most common number I hear is fifteen or twenty bucks an acre. The thing I get run into trouble with, and Jim's had the question too, is where people will go. Um, people will go. But the landlords especially will go, my tenant took all that money. I think I should have got some of that corn stock rent. And it depends on what kind of rent it is. If it's, a, if it's a cash rent, then the tenant gets all that money unless the landlord holds that out of the rent uh, or makes a provision to rent for a part of that. If it's a, if it's a crop share, then the money should, should be split between the landlord and the tenant. Yeah, and also if you're cash renting, if Alan's renting my ground, he's giving me top dollar cash rent for the ground to begin with. And if he actually owns the cattle and he's running them out there, they're trying to maximize use of your property because you're paying very high rent for some of these things. So be aware of that. And I, I do think the added benefit of grazing, uh, you know, raking up corn stock bales, that's fine. It does re remove nutrients, as Alan noted. But uh, grazing of, you know, livestock, obviously, if they eat corn stocks, they're going to be depositing the waste right back on the ground. And the cleaning up of volunteer corn, that's a major issue in certain areas sometimes. So be aware of that. All right, next question. If landlord owns, okay, so this is our classic example. Let's say you have, uh, let's say you have a parcel of ground, the landlord owns the below ground improvement, so that'd be the pump or the, the actual well, and then the renter owns the above ground, so that'd be probably like the pivot. How do you account for that in the cash rent? Um, I'll give my two cents on this and I'll let Alan chip in. We did this as a survey question back in, I think it was 2018 or 2019 as part of our real estate survey. The cash rental rates the University of Nebraska as well as the USDA publishes assumes the landlord owns the entire uh, improvement, pivot, pump, power unit, land. If you do not own that, okay, if you don't own the pivot, for example, you would probably discount the cash rent to account for the fact that the tenant has to upkeep the pivot, carry insurance, whatever. Um, some of the numbers that I've seen, if I'm doing this off the top of my head, I think the discount for the pivot can be anywhere from 25 up to 30, 35, some cases even higher. The cost of steel right now for agricultural equipment, and I would consider a pivot to be a agricultural equipment, a new eight tower uh, pivot, regardless of the brand, you're probably talking 100,000 plus right now, cost of labor, if you can even find one. So you discount Depends on what, what, what uh, amenities you put on yeah. it. And that doesn't include the swing out and gun deal on it either. No. So I do think you discount the cash rent, higher discount rate for the newer systems, maybe something not quite as much for a system that's maybe older. Yeah. No, exactly right. I mean, I just, we just have to, we just have to do right for both parties. It's just important to have that conversation and kind of know what's going on. Okay, I'll read this last question and be sure to type anything if you have another question. Uh, Alan, do you have any recommendations for a date to sign a cash rental lease? No, whatever you guys agree to is fine with me. I don't have, I mean, no, I don't want to sound flip or being a, a smart aleck or anything like that. It's just, it's just, it's a function of whatever works for both parties. I had one lease that was being signed in, in, I have lots of leases that are being signed in August because they want to get it done before that six month notice because if they can't agree on the lease, then they want to be able to give six months notice to get them out, get themselves out of that lease. I have other leases. I had one, one party called me once and they, they called me in November. I said, why are you working on a lease now? Then the, the landowner says, well, we go, to, we go to Arizona for the winter and we don't get back until well after March 1st. And so we want to get this all done now and sign the lease for next year because it's going to start March 1st. And other people will sign it right now, right before the first of March. And so, I want to give you an example that I, you know, that it doesn't, it doesn't. You can, 
You can do it whenever it works. It just has to work for both parties. Here's what I'd be careful of. If you are setting a cash rental rate for your lease, uh, make sure you kind of decide as landlord and tenant when you're going to do that kind of the same time every year, especially if you're negotiating a year to year lease. Because you have prices going up, who wants to negotiate the lease right away? The tenant. Who wants to wait till the last minute right before March 1st? The landlord. If you have prices going down, who wants to negotiate the lease right away? The landlord. Who wants to wait till right before March 1st? The tenant. So, so I think you should specify when that lease is going to be uh, uh, negotiated and you, you leave all that uh, theatrics out of it so that you can you do it in an amicable way. Yeah. Whatever you do, it's a consistency in the communication, whatever you decide. My comment on, we've asked, we thought about asking this on the real estate survey and I don't know when most leases, I would say March 1 or early March is very common. February, or, February before March 1st. Before March 1st. The one thing I do think a lot of people, you know, I'm going to rent his ground this spring and that's, I'm fine with that. Sometimes people do wait a little bit into March until they know exactly where their crop insurance guarantees are. The crop insurance guarantees are based off a 30 day average occurring during the month of February. And the crop insurance is kind of the cornerstone of risk management for many uh, row crops, small grain, whatever crop operations. So, you know, there might be people, you know, technically the lease started on, was supposed to start on May, March 1, but maybe they have that relationship established that they're fine with that. Let's go back to the, and by the way, is your last chance to send us a chat or send us a Q&A, we'd be glad to help out. All right. Um, okay. All right. Oh. All right. We had another question come into the chat. Um, we talked about there is no set standard and grazing the corn stocks. I think Alan, you know, you can have anything from free to 20, 25, maybe even $30 an acre. I do think the higher rates that are being paid for corn stocks or corn stover tend to reflect uh, sites that probably have a water source fairly nearby. Maybe they even have fairly good fencing around the property. Or, or where they're making stocks off of it by rolling the bales up. Oh, that, that sort of thing is possible. I but my, my take on that is that if you're going to pay somebody for the stocks in terms of rolling them up, that you'd be doing it just like you do for hay. In other words, half, uh, pay for half and you get half or do in the harvest. The big thing with bailing off corn stocks, and there are irrigated acres where you just have so much trash, trash and residue that you have to get it off there. Uh, be very considerate. And there are people, they bail the corn stocks off, then they turn around and haul manure right back on it. And that's that's great if you can do that. But be careful, uh, everything with moderation in life. I'm not against bailing in corn stalks. I'm just very concerned about the price of fertilizer right now. You do re remove nutrients, which is not a bad thing, but you have to be able to compensate for what you're taking off. So be aware of that. You're dropping your organic matter and your phosphorus, especially when you bail corn stalks off. We've got one more in the Q&A now. Okay, Alan, all right so it says so the rental price can be done march one rent price does not need to be september one so what alan's getting at and i i don't remember everything that was stated today if you are on a verbal lease in nebraska and you want to terminate that verbal lease you have to give the other party notice prior to september one which is six months before march 1st of the following year so that's why alan was talking about with september one why some people, they want to negotiate the lease by the end of August is if the two of them aren't getting along and they want to go their separate ways, they need to let that be known to the other party before then. If you're on a written lease, whatever is in the written lease regarding termination is what's going to carry forward. So in the written lease, some leases, they automatically terminate at the end and that's just the way they are. And you don't even have to tell the other person. Now, out of respect for the other one, you should communicate your intentions. But it's whatever. Uh, some written leases have an automatic rollover clause it's just whatever you want to have in the lease. All right, so we got that question answered. I'm pretty sure that takes care of everything for us. We're in the chat now. No. We'll, we'll check the chat one more time. Um, oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, final thing, I just want to be sure, be aware, March 24th and 25th, uh, we will be doing, we're not going to be doing any more in-person um, these style of meetings until at least this upcoming summer. We don't have anything on the books. You want to get in on a virtual meeting. We will send the handouts to your doorstep, but you have to register before the meeting. 
And if you the sooner you register, the better off you I are. Think you've got it about a week ahead of time, but be sure you get it done by a week ahead of time. Yeah, at least. And the other thing, um, May 16th, be sure to join us. Uh, we tried a little bit different setup today. I think some things worked really nice. It's kind of nice to be doing this side by side, but uh, maybe we'll get this perfected by the end of the year for sure. But uh, I think uh, this has been a good series and keep up the strong attendance so we can uh, um, keep doing this. So with that- Check out the Q&A one more time. It might be another question. Maybe not. Can we access? Yes, go to cap.unl.edu to get access to the recording. Yep, cap.unl.edu. Ryan typed that into the chat before. Oh, and the other thing, does the tenant have to give six month notice prior to the termination of the lease? If, if they're on a handshake or verbal agreement, that's ideally what you're supposed to do. I had a phone call about four years ago now already where the tenant let the landlord know right after harvest in uh, late October, hey, I, I'm not going to do the lease next year. Landlord calls me up and says, don't I have to make him do the lease? And I'm going, well, you could because he didn't give you six months notice, but I probably wouldn't force the tenant on this issue. If he wants to be out of the lease, he can, he can terminate the lease too. Uh, and I, because in most situations in Eastern Nebraska, especially, uh, no, probably clear across the state, quite honestly, uh, you can, you, if you go to a coffee shop or other place of socialization in your local community, and you let somebody know by 10 o'clock in the morning that there's a lease available on a certain car and you, uh, farm, you're going to have uh, uh, options to rent by five o'clock that afternoon. So um, there you go. All right. I mean, I'm sorry, I, that, that sounds flip, but I'm not trying to serve, but there's lots, of, there's a lot to demand for land right now. And so do not, do not think you have to stick with the, with the previous uh, uh, tenant, because if he's not, want, not into it, doesn't want to do a good job, he's just you no know, big deal. Okay. All right. We had another, all right. We're going to have to cut the, well, I answered these are the last two questions because we're going to hit the one hour mark. Uh, somebody tried registering for the meeting and they weren't able to register. Send Alan or I an email. We'll forward your email on to Ryan Evans, our media specialist here in the department, and we'll make sure you can get registered and help you work through the registration issues. And where can I see the beginning of this meeting? Uh, the, the entire recording will be posted online. Um, go, go to the last slide quick. I think it's, is it, is it, is it, is it uh, last slide, both of our contact information? Oops, let's uh, yeah, pull. go back up to the beginning. Then. There you go. All right, so if you have questions, email, phone, I've been taking a lot of calls lately, so I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Alan has as well. I will and that, Alan's been out, He'll, he will be out, or he has been out on the road a lot. I'm out, I'm out the next week and a half, but go ahead and leave, a, you can leave him a phone message at that at that phone number, I will get back to you as soon as I can. I, I'm going to be, but I'm going to be, I'm on the road for a week and a half now. Well, no, I'm, I'm pretty busy until March 10th and then we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes, but I'll do the best I can. Okay. All right. So now we should be Go sure. back to the chat. I don't think there's anything, I don't know if there's anything important there or not. Oh, there you go. Okay. So, all right. all right, Ryan uh, noted, right. Oops. Let me go back down. I apologize. Ryan noted right here, the cap.unl.edu slash webinars is where you can find the recording from today. So and just reach out all the way to back to the beginning. All right. So, all right, very good. We appreciate your time. And I got the one hour mark on my end. So uh, hopefully we worked out. We's, we're still figuring out how to manage these questions as they come in, but uh, I think we're getting a little better every time. So, all right, with that, I'll stop the share and Alan will kill the live feed. So thanks stop, for joining. Stop the recording too.